Thanks, everyone. Um, it's really nice to be back. And yeah, I'll be talking about large language models. It's a topic on everyone's mind. And it's also really been on our minds uh, for a long time. Um, as Alex mentioned, um, we, um, you might know me from Spacey, which is an open source library for natural language processing in Python, one of the most popular ones. And um, people really use Spacey to build pipelines to extract information from text. And the library has been around for quite a while, and um, we've also always put a lot of work into stability and keeping the API clean, and actually so much so that ChatGPT is now pretty good at writing Spacey code. And the other thing we're doing is Prodigy. Prodigy um, is an annotation tool for machine learning developers to create training data for machine learning models. And it's fully scriptable in Python. Um, so it really easily integrates with everything that's out there in the ecosystem and also a lot of new developments in the field. So before we dig really deep into na um, natural language processing and large language models, Let's first have a look at NLP more generally and the type of tasks that um, people are working on. So roughly, you can kind of group them into two categories. We have generative tasks, which are things like summarization, reasoning, problem solving, paraphrasing, style transfer, question answering. And on the other side, we have uh, predictive tasks. That's um, classic NLP tasks like text classification, entity recognition, relation extraction, co-reference resolution, grammar, morphology, um, semantic parsing, discourse structure. And the generative uh, tasks, they really take any freeform input and output freeform input. Um, so you could really think of it as um, generative models producing human readable output, whereas the predictive models uh, produce structured machine readable output. And um, large language models um, have really transformed, um, especially the generative space. There's so many capabilities and things we really couldn't do easily before that are now pretty straightforward and really easy to integrate into our systems. And they also show a lot of promise for the predictive tasks. So where are we going from here? How do these models fit in and how should we imagine the future of NLP and of our work? One thing I always like to do when thinking about how big changes in technology have impacted things is to look to the, into the past and look at significant moments where new technology was introduced and how people imagined it would change the world and what actually happened. And one of my absolute favorites here um, is this series of postcards um, from the, roughly around the year 1900 and it shows how people back then imagined the year 2000. So it really goes from everyday life tasks like cleaning, firefighting, knowledge acquisition, hairdressing, and an actually not so far off depiction of video calls. And uh, one thing we can really see here is that people imagined things in very human-shaped forms, because that's kind of what we see, and those are the tasks, and that's what we interact with. So um, the solutions here are very close to the actual tasks that the humans performed. And of course, the year 2000 has passed. We know the answer, and we know what technology we've built. And um, in a way, yes, all of these things were solved with technology. And some of them, actually, in a quite similar way, we've built a machine a robot vacuum cleaner that does the cleaning. But some of them um, have also been solved in slightly different ways. Yes, we've changed um, the technology for firefighting, but we've also built completely different things that solve the same problem, like smoke alarms. So even um, changing the way we build buildings uh, to prevent fires from breaking out in the first place. And the same can be said when we look at how technology has changed jobs and um, the future of work. There are some tasks that um, can, are very, very straightforwardly translated into machines, like manual calculation. We were able to replace whole rooms of people calculating things with a simple calculator. And then there's also jobs that do not exist uh, anymore and have been uh, completely eliminated, like my other favorite, uh, the job of the knocker-upper. Those were actual professions. and. Up until the 1950s, 
people were hired to walk around with a large stick and knock on people's windows before alarm clocks were reliable enough. And again, we have replaced this. Um, this job doesn't exist anymore. But as you could see here, we replaced it in a way that delivers the same value. We did not go and build a window knocking machine. We built alarm clocks. And that's something that's very important to keep in mind when imagining the future. We don't want to be thinking of imagining and building window knocking machines. We want to be think thinking about what the next alarm clock can be and what can deliver that same value. And um, another more recent example um, is trying to replace uh, human personal assistants. That's uh, something where we've seen a lot of attempts both um, replicating the human-shaped interaction as well as more clever solutions. And um, there are definitely use cases where, hey, um, doing a chatbot uh, works out quite well, but we've also seen that there are other applications that really deliver the same value as a human assistant, like sending someone a calendar link and um, really solving the problem of scheduling a meeting without going through all the steps that normally a human uh, would do to get to the same result. So with that in mind, what is next and how can we imagine large language models to have an impact and um, what will be the equivalent to an alarm clock as opposed to maybe a window knocking machine? So when we think about NLP in the age of LLMs, um, there are kind of two questions or two dimensions we can look at. One is the question, how will we interact with these models? Will we even need structured data and databases at all? Or will we mostly be querying um, a model in a dialogue form? Will, we, will everything basically become a dialogue and will we be chatting with our data? And the other question is, will we even need training data anymore? Um, how, how are we getting things out of models? Will we be um, still using humans to label data and training models from it, or will we mostly be focusing on prompting and um, will everything move to coming up with the right prompt? And to make this more concrete, here's a pretty classic uh, NLP problem, um, information extraction, that maybe if you're working in the field, you've probably encountered in some way or another. Uh, so here what we're doing is we want to um, analyze fundraising announcements and populate a database in a structured way so that we can do something with that information later. So we want to be recognizing entities, company names. We want to disambiguate them, so really map them to a specific mention of that particular company. We want to look them up in a database um, that is custom and maybe has other information that we want to use. And we also want to take these entities that we've extracted, take the currency ones, normalize it, so we end up with integers that we can do maths with, like calculate all number of um, investments that were made and how much money was invested. And then, given the entities we've extracted, we want to relate them to each other. So these are all things um, that we want to do, and of course, this is not the end of it. Usually, any model like this will feed into some other system, like an application where you can look things up, um, to really get to the information that you're interested in. And there are different visions for how this um, can be achieved in the future. One is dialogue is all you need and the large language model will really be the system and in charge of managing the whole interaction. So as a user, you will um, query the system with natural language input and it will respond with an action or with an information. So that means that really the model has to own the whole information flow and to go back to our example of the fundraising announcements, in this case, you wouldn't even need any of the structured data or any of the um, database at all. You would have a model, it has access to fundraising announcement and you can ask it questions and follow up questions and it will reply, for example, with a number and you have to trust it that it's correct. Another vision basically thinks of the large language model as replacing what we currently use um, as a machine learning system. So you would still have structured data, a user would query a system, but in order to get to that structured data, the text would be translated into a prompt and the model would be in charge of outputting 
that structured data. So the model would really be um, implemented and um, functioning at runtime here. Um, and then finally, in a, th a third version, um, or a third vision um, we can think of, the model would really be more of a compiler instead of the runtime. So it helps with building the pipeline, and we would still be building machine learning systems that produce structured data, training a model, and um, developing the code for it, and the large language model would really take the role of helping us get to that goal quicker. And of course, if it's needed, it can also um, be, take part in producing the structured data at runtime, and there can be multiple models, there can be multiple machine learning systems, and the LLM could also be working on both the structured data, or it could be helping out with um, generative uh, capabilities, which is um, where it often really makes sense to have a model like this in a loop. So if we're going back to our NLP tasks, um, we, we've seen that the model, these models have really transformed um, the generative space, and um, at this point, they're not really quite yet a drop-in replacement for a lot of the predictive tasks that are a lot more specific and really rely on producing this structured data. Um, so the question is, can we achieve better accuracy and better results by training task-specific models for these predictive tasks? And if so, where can large language models help? So, here are actually some recent experiments that we've ran and are about to um, release. Uh, we've basically look, taken a couple of data sets for text classification, assigning categories to text, and we looked at um, how well GPT-3 performs on them out of the box in a zero shot or few shot way. Um, and the first data set we looked at is um, a data set about, um, on sentiment um, analysis, sentiment classification, and here we can see that out of the box, the model um, baseline is pretty high. So we have 94% um, accuracy without having seen any examples, and we need about at least 50% of the training data if we're just training a model ourselves with Spacey to get to the same results. Still pretty good, but um, sentiment analysis is also something that's relatively general purpose and also relatively easy. So we also tried the same thing with um, a slightly more challenging data set on news classification. So here the baseline is lower and we can see that even with 1% of the data, we can train a model that significantly um, tops that accuracy. So 1% of the data here is about 1,000 examples. That's something that uh, one person individually can annotate in one or two hours. So given the improvement we see here with very little data, that's definitely something that's already worth the investment and pretty promising. Um, but still news, still a relatively easy domain, so we also tried a much harder data set. And this one is about banking. Um, it has 77 categories, so quite challenging, and all of these express very specific intents. So here the baseline is pretty low, um, and we even with 5%, we can get a significantly more accurate model, and we can also see that it doesn't even top out at 100%. So it's still, the accuracy is still going up, so that lets, um, it makes it fair to assume that if we just annotate some more examples, we can get even better results on these um, very specific tasks. And in addition to text classification, we also looked at named entity recognition, which, which is a lot more intricate um, in terms of information extraction, because we're not only predicting labels over a text, we also have to extract spans and then predict label, labels over those spans. So um, here's, here are some results on a standard evaluation set. The GPT numbers are from a paper that was actually just released the other week, and this is the current state of the art on few shot prompting. And what we can see here is that out of the box, even without having seen any examples, the accuracy is pretty good, but it still doesn't get anywhere close to the state of the art at the moment in 2023, or even the state of the art in 2003, when this data set was first released. Um, so what we can see here is, it, even though we can get significantly better accuracy by training task-specific models, these models here, um, out of the box, 
um, few short prompting, they do make pretty good prototypes. So that is definitely something um, we shouldn't underestimate because the time spent to go from basically nothing to a working version that's pretty good and can be improved is actually pretty significant. So um, to look at a more practical workflow, on the one hand, we do have these large language models. They know a lot about what the text means and the world, and they're also very large, um, but they don't really necessarily know what you want them to do, especially if it's not generic. And then on the other hand, we have the task-specific models. That, by that I mean fine-tuning BERT um, or something similar, and they know less about the text, they're smaller, they ha um, have less knowledge about the world, but they can encode exactly what you want them to do, very specifically. Even if you know what you mean, and if you know what you want, you can encode it in a model. So as a developer, what we can do is, we can take large language models, use them to produce better task-specific models, and basically get the best of both worlds. Um, and that, as, um, that includes prompt engineering, so we need to make sure that the prompt we design is good and produces the right output. Uh, we need to define the problem, take the bigger business problem, break it down into components, into things uh, we can actually express and train as a model. We can, that feeds into the data annotation. We need to create the examples for our model with the help of the large language model. We need to train a model. And of course, we also need to evaluate it because we need a stable and robust way to find out whether our model does what we want it to do and also whether anything we do and change and improve actually improves the model. And the task-specific model will be more efficient, smaller, um, more um, you know, to the point, more predictable, and that's also the model we can then more easily ship to production and it's ours. So when we go back to NLP in the age of LLMs and the different visions, we basically see that we kind of have to align ourselves somewhere in the middle here. We definitely need structured data. There's kind of no way around that. It's incredibly useful for a lot of applications, especially if we're looking at predictive tasks. We also really need humans, and we need the humans to be in the loop. We need humans to help evaluate the models. We need humans to help create the training data and check that it's correct if we're training task-specific models. So um, we need, at least at some point, um, humans in the loop. And we can use large language models for faster prototyping. Um, we don't need to wait until we have a small data set that we can train from. We can build a prototype and have a working system that we can improve. And that will likely lead to a lot more projects going ahead and being successful, which is great. And we've also seen that we really need to work with the models and we need to work with the code and we need to really get in there and iterate. So, Open source is very important here because it lets us work with the code. We, this can't happen in an entirely closed off environment where we don't have any control over the code, over the data, or over the models. And finally, while there are tons of use cases where conversational interfaces um, add a lot and are great, there are also a lot of cases where other interfaces are much better at providing the same type of value. And where a conversational interface um, you know, is much more the equivalent of a window knocking machine um, than the alarm clock. So um, both of that uh, will still be relevant. So, how does this really work in practice if you're a machine learning developer? How, how is this uh, going to work? So we really envision the solution um, and the LLM-powered NLP as a collaborative development environment for your data that is powered by large language models that help you annotate data, create data sets for specific tasks, and also allow humans to get in there and review the labeling decisions and correct the errors. And at the same time, you need to be able to tune the prompts, make sure that you're using the models optimally, compare them, compare them to task-specific models, and finally, build data sets, train, evaluate, and build the right pipelines that really solve the problems efficiently. So here's an example of how this data development process could look. This is an example from our annotation tool, Prodigy, but um, you can also do something similar in a lot of other tools, so even just in plain text, if that's what you prefer. So here, we are annotating or creating data for a named entity recognition model 
um, that annotates dishes, ingredients, and equipment in posts from the cooking subreddit. So in this case, we're sending that text to the OpenAI API and ask it to respond with the structured information about those entities. And we then map them back into the original text and display them. So, of course, inevitably, there are going to be mistakes, and in the UI, you'll be able to correct them. And you're also able to add correct or especially important answers and um, examples that you've corrected to the prompt in order to um, improve the future predictions. But of course, we have another problem here, which is that language models out of the box will respond with unstructured text. Unstructured text goes in, unstructured text comes out. So the challenge here is given a prompt and a natural language response, how do we go for, and map it back into the original text into a structure that we can actually work with? And for that, we have an extension to Spacy, which is called Spacy LLM, that basically does this and takes care of the prompting, making the query, and then parsing out the response and setting these annotations back into Spacy's data structures so you can access them in the original input. And this means, given some unstructured text input, you can get a structured doc object out of it that has all the structured information you need, and you can do various different things along the way. For example, lemmatization, resolving the words to their base form, which, especially in languages that are not English, can actually be very important if you're analyzing text. You can recognize entities, classify the text, extract relations, and for each of these components, you can mix and match the different approaches and different techniques that you want to use. So you can have a large language model in your prototype or maybe even in your final system. If it um, performs the best, you can replace it with a task-specific supervised model if you want and augment it with rules if there are things where you definitely know the answer and can get better accuracy. And as you can see, there's really a lot to do and really a lot to think about if you are um, working uh, with NLP. And one thing that's usually the center of the discussion when we're talking about large language models is it really focuses on how easy it is, how easy it is to get started and how easy it is to build systems. And that's definitely true and a really important aspect. But in a lot of cases, easier just isn't enough. We also want things to be good. And we shouldn't be settling for systems that are worse than what we're currently building. Because currently, companies, developers, are building a lot, and are building a lot that's incredibly valuable. So we want to match that. We don't just want things to be easy. We also want them to be good. And if we know the answers, and if we know exactly what we want, we can build models that are specific and really solve our problem. We don't need to settle for something general purpose if we can define a model that does the thing we want, and if we can use um, large language models, for instance, to help us create data for these models and train systems that we control and that really do exactly what we want. We also don't have to settle for incredibly long API latency, our models that are incredibly expensive or annoying um, or difficult to run and serve because they're so large. If we have a specific thing in mind, we can actually train models that are good or even, even significantly better and that are smaller, faster, and that we own and we can deploy efficiently. And we also don't have to settle for APIs and third-party services where we don't know what our data is going to be used for. A lot of high-value use cases work with data that's private, and that's fine. And you should be able to train models that are yours and that you own and that you control and can run yourself um, in a very fully private environment. And finally, we shouldn't settle for anything that's worse than what it should be. The, new possibilities and new capabilities of the new models that we have introduce so much new potential. And we should be able to build things that are better. And we should be able to build things that exceed what we can do at the moment and not let anyone tell you that you should settle for anything less. We can build things that are better. Thanks.
Thank you very much. We have, you yeah. know, we have plenty of time for <laughs> questions. So, if you have a question here in the room, there are mics up there and there. Please just stand up and ask your question. So, if you cannot come up with a question, you can use ChatGTP to come <laughs> up with a question for you. You can do prompt, what should I ask Ines Montani of Spacey about large language models? <laughs> I would actually be curious. Yeah, I would be curious. Let's do that. <laughs> so, okay. Yeah, but I think uh, one, let me ask a question. Yeah. So I think actually uh, when large language models were released, I said, oh, Spacey, what, what will this mean for Spacey? Will this be like a replacement because we need all these tools no longer? But basically you pointed out, hey, it's just also like in our space is the best system ever because it also relieves us from a lot of human labor, like creating domain specific yeah. models, right? Yeah, and it's actually, in a way, I think it's also really showing how important it is to have pipelines of different components yeah. that do different specific things. And mm -hmm. um, because for a while there was kind of this idea that like, oh, all you need is like one model and that's it. And I think especially LLMs have shown that you want to do different things mm -hmm. at different points, have different prompts. And so uh, the pipeline design of space really helps there. Yeah, and also I think some, many people forget your business secrets or like business, special business knowledge will ne can never be in a large language model. I mean, it shouldn't be unless you leaked all your internal data. <laughs> that's another point. So we have questions. I think uh, the yeah. gentleman in the green shirt was first. Right. Um, thanks for a talk. Uh, it's been really interesting. Um, my question is on, um, uh, you proposed like uh, um, generating input and, uh, and um, training data for specific models. Um, I was wondering, uh, when training a model, you would generally always have to uh, deal with biases. And like when you're, selecting, uh, when you're selecting training data yourself, you at least know what the training data is from and what bias it may have, but when you now take data generated by a, a large language model, how do you even keep track of that or how do you, how do you, would you um, uh, assess that? Yeah, so I think in short the answer is, well, you definitely still need humans in the loop and also a lot of the suggestions I presented were mostly around using the model to put structure into the data. So often the assumption is, um, usually the main problem is you have a bunch of raw text lying around and you want to train a model to analyze it. And so you can use a large language model to help you put the structure into the text you already have. And of course, you still want to review that, but you're not necessarily generating new examples. Okay. But if you, you can do that, I think for paraphrasing, there are a lot of interesting ideas, um, data augmentation um, that could be super useful. But yeah, I think you, yeah, you don't get around having humans in a loop the same way you would um, in other scenarios. All right, thanks. Yeah. I think the next one. Thank you for your talk. Uh, I was curious, in the example you, you demonstrated of converting unstructured data to structured data, how robust is it? Is it like always guaranteed that you'll get something that could be parsed at, as an output or not? Uh, no. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's genuinely difficult, so, and there are different approaches. I think at the moment what we would do is if it doesn't match, because the model might respond with something completely arbitrary, like you can't necessarily control that, and if it does, then this would be the equivalent to a model you've trained not predicting something, even though there's something there. So that's kind of how we treat it, but um, yes, that's definitely a challenge if you get freeform output back. It might or might not, or sometimes it just stops at some point. That's also really common depending on the model. It just sort of gives up halfway through, and then, um, yeah, we have to deal with that. But I hope that that is something that also can be better, and we're definitely we're also super keen um, to look at fine-tuning models to be better for these kind of structured prediction tasks, because there's a lot of low-hanging fruit, I think, that hasn't been fully explored. Okay, thank you. Um, I have a very naive question. Um, do you think one can do the thing the other way around? So now you are proposing to use LLM to improve natural language processing. Can one use the data or the code or the structured data from NLP to improve LLM to go in the other direction? Um, yeah, actually, this is this question ties in slightly to what I what I just mentioned before. Like, given all of this 
you know, experience and all of the outputs and everything we created here, we could consider fine-tuning an LLM to be better at producing the structured data, so going the other way around. I think that's um, definitely super relevant. And um, yeah, we also, it feels like we sometimes end up at this nlp exception where we have a model that outputs, suddenly it outputs natural language again, and then we're like, ah, damn, now we need to use NLP again to take the output of that model and turn it into something useful. So there's definitely, there's definitely a cycle there and a lot of interesting things to explore. Next question from the back. Yes, thank you very much for the talk, and thank you very much for Spacey, which is a fantastic library, oh, well documented, I'm using it, I'm loving it. Um, I'd like to have your take on something which um, has happened, um, which is that OpenAI refused to publish the details about GPT-4, and uh, right now I'm wondering, and I would like to hear your take because you're much deeper than me in, in all this world, um, are we running towards a model where all the major players are going to publish cross source LLMs more and more powerful, or will open source come back? What, what's your take on this? Yeah. I think we'll have both. Um, and um, yes, sure, there's you know, open AI. That's also why I think um, a lot of practitioners in the field are quite skeptical, and it's not really something you, know, you can rely on for these types of um, robust tasks, because it can also change at any time. There was also, I think recently, the model changed, and OpenAI says, no, we didn't change the model, and then you kind of have to read between the lines. They say they didn't change the model, but maybe they changed something else around it. It's completely intransparent, but it doesn't have to be that way. There are other um, providers that can also train models and release them um, in more developer-friendly ways. They are open source models. Um, a lot of these things are not really kept private for long. There's research happening in parallel. Um, I don't think, um, you know, yes, that's something at the moment, that's happening at the moment, but I don't think um, that will be, yeah. It's just, I think we're kind of seeing the same pattern repeat that people had way back in the day where everyone had these closed up APIs and what won in the end is open source. People need to program, people need to, um, you know, really work with the models and that's not gonna change. Thank you. Yeah, so basically, OpenAI is a black box to us. Yeah. Right. And there's different. There's hugging face with many law models, so there's more transparency there. Okay. Next question, Jakob. Uh, I think we've all experienced when ChatGPT uh, spews nonsense. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm wondering, would it be possible to build some sort of measurement of certainty in the answer in, into the models? or? Is this something that's going to play these models forever? Um, I think there is. So I'm not like super deep in that part of the research, but there's definitely been movements towards building in more explainability, or at least having the model try and cite sources or examples, or try to get a bit closer to like what is this based on. But of course, even there, we've already seen. I think with the search engine bots that like if you post a lot of nonsense on the internet, the bot will then um, eventually cite your nonsense link as the source. Um, and I think, especially in that area, we'll always see a race of spammers against uh, developers. Um, but I do think for these use cases that I'm thinking about and that are more developer focused, I do think there's a lot of interesting stuff happening in the explainability area, getting more, um, you know, getting results with different temperatures and different certainties, um, looking at them, deciding which one to use, which one is most likely correct. I think that's, um, that's definitely possible on a development level, but I think on the more general internet level, we'll always see this race um, of people trying to produce nonsense and people trying to prevent nonsense. And I think that's gonna just keep following us around forever. We have one remote question oh. from Yoni. And Yoni actually asked ChatGTP. Oh, what? cool. So what does ChatGPT yeah. say? I'm just reading it to you. <laughs> it's pretty cute. Dear Ines Montani, I hope this message can find you well. <laughs> As a part of the development team behind Spacey, one of the leading libraries for natural language processing, your insights would be invaluable. Thank so, you. You see, JetGTP <laughs> thinks you're smart, you're credible. <laughs> Spacey is incredible. That's good. So, given your expertise in NLP and the recent advancements in large language models, I'm curious about your perspective on the intersection of the two. Specifically, how do you see large language models like 
GTP4 affecting the future of libraries like Spacey? Can these models be integrated into Spacey's pipeline to improve certain tasks, such as named entity recognition? <laughs> Parts of speech tagging or dependency parsing? Or conversely, do you see these models possibly replacing traditional models altogether? Thank you for your time and insights. <laughs> Wow, I mean, that's... disclaimer, JetGTP did not see your keynote, Ned. Yeah, I was just going but... to comment on that. But um, yeah, it's also, it's a bit long-winded. It's like, Yes, oh. it's long-winded, but it's yeah. interesting. But yeah. But... but yeah, I think, I hope I answered all of ChatGPT's questions in uh, my talk today. No, you today. have to write back. I'm just reading the question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay, next question. <laughs> Okay, thank you. So, uh, sticking uh, with uh, OpenAI for a bit longer, uh, they recently released this feature called uh, Function Calling, I think. Uh, I'm just wondering if you had a chance to try it out and what do you think about it? Because, in a sense, it does uh, what you have described during, during your keynote, which is uh, basically uh, using a generative uh, model to produce a structured output. So I'm just curious what you do think about it. Yeah, yeah. so I've, I've definitely seen it. Um, haven't really uh, tried it much, but like it definitely, you know, it shows that, um, you know, that is, it's something other people are thinking about as well. I would say that like, I think OpenAI generally target a lot more use cases that are uh, consumer focused and where really, you know, the API is mostly like part of a system. So I feel like I still don't, I don't see OpenAI really going into the developer space or offering things that are really useful um, to work with. And I think also there's still a lot of the, even the basic suggestions for structured tasks don't yet work very well. Like for example, we've tried out what OpenAI recommends for entity recognition and that's like pretty meh. Then that, um, those results I showed and that prompt NER paper that works much, much better. And so we can see there's still, like, there's a lot of active research happening and there's a lot more that can be done. Um, but yeah, I haven't, I haven't tried it out in detail yet. Okay, thank you. We have time for two more questions. Perfect. Um, I have a question. Um, what do you think about uh, support of uh, other natural languages than, than English? You think uh, that uh, features that we saw today can be available uh, for other languages, I don't know, like Arabian, Chinese, and... Um, yeah, I, th I think that's actually super important and something that isn't talked about enough. Um, of course, yeah, a lot of the research is happening in English. The general rule of thumb is the closer a language is to English, the better it works <laughs> for NLP. Um, but I think there's basically, yeah, a huge... Also something we'd, we'd be very excited um, about working on because there are a lot of the more classic NLP tasks that maybe people often ignore, like lemmatization, um, that are not so interesting for English, but actually if you look at other languages, it becomes much, much more relevant. You want the base forms of words if you, um, you know, want to compute something oh, oh, over um, a corpus of text that you have, or even tokenization, what's a word? That's something that a lot of English speakers don't really think about, but if you look at Chinese, um, there's a whole, you know, that you can't just separate on white space. So even those boring old school NLP things are much more relevant in other languages. And I think, um, yeah, that, that is an exciting area. We also definitely want to try out more multilingual models. But yeah, I think the, the bottleneck is data because yeah, there's just, such a huge amount of English internet to train these models on, and um, that would be significantly harder for, say, Czech or um, other lower resource languages. Yeah, I think sometimes you, even if you have JetGTP write something, you get like a certain zeitgeist even in it, like, yeah. like, yeah, too many cooking blog posts or something like that. So, last question, please. Don't you believe powerful open source larger uh, LLMs might bring Skynet closer sooner? Um, so, sorry, what open source LLMs? Open source powerful LLMs. Um, yeah, I think there's a lot of there's a lot happening. Um, there are a lot of models you can already try out. Also in Spacey LLM, there are a lot of open source models we already support, um, and I think it's great to have these models. And especially if we work a bit more on distillation, it I think it will become really viable to run these internally. Yeah, but I meant, um, don't, you think, don't you think it's going to bring Skynet closer? Oh, Skynet. I don't think that's something we, um, that's something that makes sense to think about. Um, 
Have you read, sorry, only one more yeah. question. Yeah. Have you read uh, Live 3.0? Anybody read it from uh, Max Tegmark? No, sorry. <laughs> okay, it's the tale of the Omega team. It's a basically a, a good ending, I would ah, say. Ah, <laughs> okay. Yeah, no, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Ines, for coming by for the keynote. <laughs>